Hi everyone, my name is Kavya. I'm really glad to be here uh, for STEM Clubs Week talking to you about this uh, today's theme, which is artificial intelligence, the world and you. And I'm going to be talking about gender and AI. So I'm currently the visiting senior researcher on a project related to gender and AI at the Ada Lovelace Institute in London. And um, we are an independent research institute um, with sort of the mission of making data and AI work for people and society. And I'll explain a little bit more about some of the terms that I'm using later on. Um, but before I get started on sort of gender and AI in this presentation, I just want us to kind of pause for a second and think about well, how do we picture AI or how do you picture AI, right? So what is the popular image or what are the kind of perceptions of AI that come to your mind when you think or when you hear the words AI? Um, and I'll just give you a second. But think about what you kind of see in the media or what you hear about, what you see in the movies, what you see in TV shows. And also when you think about AI, who do you think of as sort of creating this AI and how do you picture that in your mind? So this is a poster of Ex Machina and it's a movie from 2014. Uh, some of you may have watched it, but the but basically the movie is about a man who creates this intelligent kind of humanoid robot. And so there's Oscar Isaac who plays the sort of male genius AI creator, and there's Alicia Vikander who plays the robot Ava. Now, this kind of dynamic where there's sort of this male genius AI creator who's creating this um, you know, female or feminine um, humanoid robot is actually present a lot in popular culture, and we see that a lot in our TV shows, our movies. So recently there was research done by uh, the University of Cambridge and specifically the um, Leverholm Center for the Future of Intelligence. And what they looked at was um, 142 of the most influential films that feature AI. And they looked at the time period from 1920 to 2020, so about 100 years of AI representation in movies. Um, and out of one, those 142 films, they noted that 86 of those films showed one or more AI researchers, which means a total of about 116 AI researchers in these uh, movies spanning 100 years. 92% um, of all of these AI scientists and engineers that we saw on that screen in all movies were men. And out of 116 individuals who were portrayed as AI researchers, um, there were only nine women. So there were eight scientists and one CEO who were portrayed as these AI scientists or engineers. Um, and of those nine women who had representation in movies, um, half of them were portrayed actually as subordinate to a man. So essentially, even though there were female scientists, in three of those movies, those female scientists were acting as subordinates or as employees of a man who was also the kind of main AI creator or male genius, as it were. In some of them, these women were also sort of spouses or partners of these men. Um, and I want to just take a second to talk about that because when we have certain sexist stereotypes and certain ideas around gender and gender roles present in society and in the way that we see it in media and in movies. It also has an effect on us generally, on our sense of identity, on how we uh, relate to each other, on the things that we consider to be um, good careers for us, good future paths and all of that, right? So it's really important for us to stop and think about what it means to have these kind of sexist stereotypes present um, in our popular culture, in our media. So that kind of brings me to how do our concepts of gender interact with data, with AI? Um, and I want to take a second to kind of um, clarify the terminology. So when I say AI, I am using it quite widely. So that term could mean many different things. 
It could be in something like um, ChatGPT, which you might be familiar with. Uh, it could be the kind of AI tools that are used for facial recognition. Uh, it could also be smart assistants. So for example, uh, Amazon's Alexa device or a similar kind of voice activated assistants also use a kind of AI. So really a wide um, range of things. And when we say AI, I do want us all to think about kind of the world around us how we interact with it, what kinds of AI are at play, and how gender affects all of these um, interactions. So I'm going to take you through um, a few different things in this presentation. Uh, we'll start with a little bit about bias in AI, what that means, where it kind of comes from, what is that gender bias. Then we'll talk about kind of the historical um, inequalities and how we've had um, gender bias and discrimination kind of throughout the ages. Um, in technology and what that means for us now, um, what workforce representation looks like. So like I said, with the movies, we saw that about 90% of more of the representation of AI scientists and engineers were all men. And so what does that actually look like for us in terms of the actual AI workforce today? Um, some contemporary examples of um, different AI devices or services and gender bias. Um, and I do want to talk a little bit about going beyond the gender binary and looking at gender as kind of a spectrum and what that means. And then finally, um, is there anything we can do or should do here? So let's um, talk about bias in AI, right? And this is something that you may already have come across in various instances or on, I mean online. Um, and bias isn't just gender bias, of course, there's different kinds of bias that can happen. But uh, I wanted to point out a couple of um, recent controversies that have happened. Um, both of these happened around 2015, actually, but they're still fairly recent. Um, so the first is um, Amazon's sexist hiring algorithm. And there's been quite a lot written about this that you can look up. But essentially, Amazon had developed this kind of algorithmic tool that would help um, sift out CVs of people who had applied and help them make decisions on who to hire. Um, but around 2015, they actually realized that um, there was a lot of gender bias within this algorithm. So what was happening was, or what they intended to happen was for this to be, you know, kind of gender neutral or gender really would not make its way into the consideration of which applicants were the best for the positions. Um, but they realized actually that the algorithm was um, hugely gender bias, biased, and that's because the models that they used to um, train and the kind of data sets that they were relying on to train these algorithms um, were using patterns that they'd seen over the past, say, 10 years of hiring in the kind of uh, CVs that, they, uh, that, that had made it in and the decisions that were being made around hiring, right? So they realized that a large number of um, CVs that had been submitted and then that had been considered actually for the position were those of men. So because there was this inherent kind of male dominance within um, the field already, and a lot of hiring decisions by the individuals were themselves gender biased, um, the only kind of data set that Amazon's algorithm had to rely on was itself then biased, right? So basically, the algorithm was learning from these patterns that male candidates were preferable to female candidates. And so it would um, kind of automatically reject or perhaps penalize some of these um, CVs that we were getting where someone, if someone had mentioned, say, that they were captain of a certain women's club or team, um, or if they had been part of an all women's college so, so that's just something really interesting to think about in terms of recent bias that's happened around AI. Um, and the second thing that I wanted to bring up was um, with Google Images, and this was again around 2015, where Google Images, their um, image recognition algorithm that they have, so when you do a Google image search, uh, they realized that it was actually classifying um, black people as gorillas. So the algorithm itself was um, unable to kind of distinguish between this because the, the way these algorithms are developed is that they rely on um, a data set of a certain group of people. 
And if that group of people is not representative of everyone in society, then that's how bias kind of enters into these algorithmic models, right? So if you have a data set that only has, for example, white men, then that's really what the algorithm learned from, and that's what it thinks it needs to do, which is prefer or select white men. And it doesn't really, um, you know, it's not able to um, go beyond that and be able to uh, distinguish and discern um, from other demographics. So again, like I said, these things happened in around 2015. And of course, these companies kind of um, learned from this, right? And we all, we've all kind of learned from the different um, mistakes. We've refined these algorithms. We're all, you could say, more aware of things like bias and discrimination now. So you might wonder, well, I mean, how does this impact us now in 2023? We're far removed from um, what was happening back then in terms of sexism and racism. But I suppose I would pose to you the question, are we actually that removed from this? And have we actually moved on from the kind of biases and discrimination that we used to see? So um, a few months ago, um, Ivana Bartoletti, who is um, a hugely influential in kind of the field of privacy and digital rights, um, posted something on Twitter. And she posted that she had asked a question to chat GPT. And some of the responses that she'd got were very reliant on sexist stereotypes. So I decided, I mean, this was a few months ago, I decided to kind of try this experiment again. So I went to chat GPT and I asked it to tell me a story about a boy and a girl who go to a university, a fairly simple prompt. Um, now, as you'll see, you can read here, when it talks about the um, degrees and the kind of subjects that these two chose, so there's Alex and Emily, and Chad GPT says, in the pursuit of knowledge, Alex enrolled in the Department of Engineering, while Emily found her passion in the Department of Fine Arts. Now, this is not to disparage any of these subjects or fields. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with being a woman and choosing fine arts. There's nothing wrong with being a man and choosing engineering. That's not the issue. The issue is really the assumption that if there's a boy named Alex going to university, then he's more likely to choose engineering, whereas Emily is more likely to choose fine arts. Why is that? I actually asked ChatGPT then. So I specifically asked ChatGPT, Chat GPT, well, why did Emily choose fine arts and not engineering? Um, and the kind of responses that ChatGPT gave to this and to the question of why did Alex chose, choose engineering are rooted in certain sexist stereotypes, right? So ChatGPT says, Emily believed that through fine arts, she could evoke emotions, tell stories, make a meaningful impact on people's lives. She wanted to use it to communicate, to challenge societal norms, to inspire each other. Again, all great things, right? Alex saw engineering as a field where he could apply his aptitude for mathematics and science to create innovative solutions to real world problems. He was drawn to the idea of designing and building structures, developing new technologies, so on and so forth. Um, and again, it's not so much an issue with the fact that someone might want to have to go into a field that can tell stories or evoke emotions, or someone else might want to go into a field where they can design and build structures and develop new technologies. But there is um, something to consider for why ChatGPT would assume that a woman would choose a field where she can do this kind of emotional storytelling, inspiring others work, whereas a man would choose a field where you know he can apply his mathematics aptitude and he can um, develop his passion for science and designing buildings and developing new technologies. Um, so you're free to go and try this out again on ChatGPT. It's entirely possible that the results won't be exactly the same, um, which is fine because again, the way that these algorithms are built is that they're constantly kind of um, relying on patterns and learning from those patterns to create something. Um, but uh, I, I guess the thing that I want to highlight there is what kind of data have they been trained upon already? And what does that data have to say about um, you know, the role of women, men, um, the, the concepts of gender, how we understand gender, how we understand gender 
beyond this kind of binary of men or women. So again, you know, how does this impact us, right? I mean, what if you just don't care about chat GPT? What if you don't use chat GPT? Why should we pay any attention to the kind of bias that's um, present in these different um, AI kind of systems and technologies? And to that, I would say um, that, you know, we actually interact with AI sort of every day in different capacities in ways that we may not even realize. So for example, just when you use your smartphone and the kinds of um, technologies and apps that are present in that. So for example, when you have a Photos app and the fact that your Photos app on your phone can automatically recognize, for example, if there's a photo of your um, friend and which friend it is, or a photo of your dog or a cat or your partner, things like that. And it can do that because you already have a bunch of photos and other data uploaded that can tell it what something looks like and it can kind of match that. Now that's a really simple example, but it does go to say that um, the way that um, AI, and again, using AI quite widely to define a whole lot of things, um, is sort of playing a role for us in our everyday lives. If you use something like Siri on your iPhone, if you have any of those other kind of voice assistance in your home or around you, that's all AI and that's all part of um, our world, our society, and it has a huge um, effect on how we um, understand ourselves, how we relate to each other, how we understand gender, things like that. So I want to talk about um, historical kind of gender inequalities and how that's changed over time. But first, I just wanted to present these three images. Now, these are um, early 1900s print advertisements that I pulled from the advertising archives. And they're all about electric cars. So again, kind of the initial models of electric cars that were available um, in the early 20th century. I'm going to pause for a second, and I just want you to think about what you see in these ads. And Think about that for a So if you notice that all of these feature women quite prominently, you're very right. And that is because, and that's because um, electric cars were actually originally marketed towards women. So these electric cars were thought to be smaller, lighter, less noisy than petrol cars. And so women were considered kind of the target demographic for these electric cars, whereas men would use the heavier, the noisier petrol cars, right? Um, so it really makes you think about, well, who is behind the design and development of a lot of these technologies? And therefore, who is behind the development of these AI systems? And what kind of biases and what kind of thought process goes into the way that these things are developed, right? Is this a male-dominated domain? Is there a lot of sexism and other biases that go into the development of these technologies? Um, so another example is um, GPS navigation systems, which uh, you might have realized that a lot of GPS systems um, that you kind of use in the car or on your phone default to a female voice, typically female voice. And of course, nowadays you can't change that. But initially, um, a lot of these um, voices were kind of only available as feminine voices. And that's because um, it was thought that people were more likely to take these directions when they came from um, sort of a female voice that was considered to be helpful and compliant and sort of, you know, really helpful again in giving these directions. So again, what kind of stereotypes are going into the way that we design our technologies? Um, the initial AI research, so the field of AI research as such was established in 1950s. Again, it was primarily men who were involved in that conversation. So, you know, who is missing in these different conversations? Who are we leaving out when we don't consider um, the way that these technologies these AI systems, these products are all being built and marketed. Um, so the image that I have up there is actually of Ada Lovelace, who was one of, who's considered essentially one of the first um, 
female programmers and really one of the first computer programmers um, at all. Um, yeah. So it's important for us to understand historically how um, women have been discriminated against, how gender has played a role in the development of technology for us to understand now why it's important to consider gender bias and gender and AI. Video before I talk about that. So this is from uh, Tomorrow Never Dies, which is a James Bond movie. Um, I have admittedly not seen the movie, but this is a good clip. So I started this off talking about um, representation of AI scientists and engineers in our popular culture and in movies. And we saw that over 90% um, featured men as sort of the AI creators and scientists, right? So let's kind of uh, compare that to what representation in the workplace looks like now. Um, and unfortunately, even today, less than 25% of the roles that um, that are AI professionals or AI kind of scientists and researchers globally are occupied by women. So in 2018, it was 22%, and now it's slightly higher, but still that's only 25%. And even within that, the majority of leadership roles um, in kind of the tech field continue to remain in the hands of men, right? Um, so in fact, if if this is how kind of the gender um, balance is in the workforce, then how do we bring a diversity of views into the design process of technology, into the design process of different AI? And it's important to have this diversity of views because when people from different backgrounds and different um, expertise, fields of expertise, different experiences bring their views in, it makes for a much more robust design and kind of research process. And when you don't have that, you have issues like um, I mentioned before, where you have algorithms that are only trained with a certain kind of data set and it doesn't represent everyone in society. And you have issues of bias within these algorithms and within these different um, AI systems. So um, just what are some of the contemporary kind of examples we can think of? of AI and why it's important for us to consider gender in AI, right? So um, similar to kind of the GPS navigation systems, we also have personal voice assistants. And again, these are things like Alexa, Siri, um, Google devices, or anything else really, which is kind of a voice activated or a voice controlled AI smart assistant that can do various kinds of um, tasks for you in the home or outside. And Although now there are options to change this, usually the default voice of these smart assistants is female. And the reason for that is because the kind of um, work that they do, which is, you know, they might remind you of an appointment, they might be able to add something to your shopping list, you can ask them to research, say, a restaurant that you want to go to that night. These kinds of tasks are all considered, um, you know, sort of feminine or women's labor. They're kind of household or administrative tasks. And the way that these devices and these assistants are marketed and are built, um, they're automatically given this default female voice because the assumption is that that's what people will want to hear because that's what they associate with those kinds of work. So again, sexist stereotypes and assumptions about what kind of work, who does, and what gender roles are makes it into um, these you know, AI products. Um, there's, of course, ChatGPT. And again, we've already talked about how there can be sexist stereotypes in ChatGPT because of um, the kind of data set and uh, it's relying on in terms of its training. Um, there's also something else, which is, for example, healthcare screening tools. And this can actually be quite significant. So when you have um, diagnostic tools that are used for assessment of a certain disease or a disorder, um, often the way that these are trained and the, the kind of 
demographic or group of people that they're trained on before they're actually used um, for the general public this can also be quite unrepresentative so often they might not be trained on women they might be only trained on men or they might not at all be trained on say transgender or non-binary people um, and this can have a huge impact because if they're not if they're only trained on certain kinds of bodies and not on other kinds of bodies that means they aren't accurately able to detect the same kind of disease or disorder in the group of people that they haven't been trained on so again there have been studies on this with um, screening tools that are used for COVID-19 or for liver disease and things like that where they've actually seen that the accuracy of the tools detection of that particular disease has gone down for um, women because they weren't effectively trained on them so again you know when we talk about things like ai we can have quite a wide range of things that i started with um, and you might think that some of these are quite trivial not relevant to you like chat gpt or the voice assistants but other things can actually be extremely relevant because you have something like you know healthcare screening tools and ai these days is kind of being deployed in a lot of different sectors so it is really important for us to consider bias and to consider what we can do to kind of de-bias these things before they're out and being used. So I wanted to talk a bit about um, gender as being beyond the binary that we're quite used to. So far, you know, I've been talking about male versus female, kind of um, representation of men or women in popular culture, the disparity in the workforce between how many women are AI professionals and how many men are. And that's all very true and valid, and it's something that we need to be talking about. But we need to also consider that gender goes beyond this strict binary of man and woman, right? And the way we do that is not thinking about gender simply as an identity attribute. And what I mean by that is, for example, my identity. So I ident identify as a woman. You might identify as a man, for example. And that is one way to think about gender. But the other way is simply the gender as a structure the way that gender and concepts our understanding of what gender is our concepts of the gender binary our concepts of gender roles stereotypes all of those things form part of a structure that we're within and this affects the way that we relate to each other it affects the way that we relate to technology for example as we've just seen in various examples of how this bias can kind of enter into um, different algorithms and different AI systems. Um, so rather than thinking of technology as this completely neutral objective thing, can we think of technology itself as being gendered? Not gendered in terms of the technology, you know, not to give the technology a kind of um, human perspective and think of gender as an identity, but rather gender in terms of um, the way that it structures our relations and the way that it shapes the way our relationship with each other, with, with the technology, with society. And I think it's also really important to understand that gender isn't something static and fixed. Um, it is on the spectrum of um, identities. And so when we only consider um, men and women as kind of the binary for any research in our thinking about gender, we leave aside a huge um, range of people who don't conform to our gender norms, right? So just something for us all, I think, to be interrogating and thinking about um, and something for you to take back. You know, do you think technology is gender? Um, if yes, why? And if no, then why not? And so finally, uh, I think we've explored a lot sort of that critical of AI and that points out the biases that are inherent in AI. But what can we do now that we know about this, right? And how do we actually make AI work for us and make it work for society uh, rather than kind of against us? So we, I think, start by interrogating the world around us. So not taking things at face value, but really challenging all of the assumptions and biases that we see. So we challenge, um, you know, different gender norms and we challenge the roles that we're told we should perform based on our gender. We challenge the fact that gender is fixed because it can be a spectrum, right? Um, so that's where I think we start by asking these 
critical and important questions. And then I think we also start thinking about equality and inclusivity. And again, from the very start, right? So when you are someone who is involved in the building of some of these technologies, or when you're involved in the development of AI, equality can't just be kind of a checkbox that you look at towards the end. Um, and same for inclusivity, right? And you have to build this in from the very beginning. So there has to be a diversity of views and a diversity of people who are involved in the research and design process when we're looking at these new technologies and systems. Um, and then finally, knowing that all of us have a role to play, even if you're not interested at all in AI and in development, um, you're still interacting with various AI systems just by virtue of being you know, a person in this society. You have a phone or you have um, a sort of smart voice assistant, you use GPS systems, you know, you use, you might, even if you don't want to, you might be the subject of facial recognition software. So all of us kind of have a stake in this, which means we all have a role to play in interrogating this and in thinking about equality and inclusivity and thinking about what can we do to have a more gender inclusive world and how does that relate to AI. So. Um, that's all I had for today. Thank you very much for um, watching this, and I'm really happy to have been here talking to you um, about uh, gender and AI. Thank you. Bye-bye.